Hello. I want to welcome you to our forum today where we will be looking at the serious impact the coronavirus pandemic has had on minority communities across America. We're streaming this live on Facebook, YouTube, and the Harvard Forum website. My name is Joe Neal, and I'm a deputy science editor at NPR News. I'll be today's moderator. Joining me today are Bob Blendon, who is Richard L. Mitchell Professor of Public Health and a professor of health policy and political analysis emeritus at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. David Williams. Uh, David is a Florence Sprague Norman and Laura Smart Norman Professor of Public Health and also Chair of the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard Chan School. Ngozi Nzike is Director of Public Health for the State of Illinois. Barbara Ferrer is Director of the Department of Public Health for the County of Los Angeles. And we'll, have, we'll hear from Howard Coe. Howard Coe is the Harvey V. Feinberg Professor of the Practice of Public Health Leadership at the Harvard T.H. Chan School and the Harvard Kennedy School, as well as faculty co-chair of the Harvard Advanced Leadership Institute. Quite a distinguished panel we have here today. Viewers joining us in the Zoom can submit their questions here, or you can also email your questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. As of right now, 206,000 people have died of COVID-19 in the United States. That's 6,000 more than just this time last week. Rising infect, uh, infection rates are rising in all but about a dozen states, so we're likely to see deaths accelerate in the coming weeks as people get sick from these increasing infections. The burden of this illness and death has fallen disproportionately on minority communities, and that's who we're going to focus on today. The pandemic is not only a public health crisis, it's also an economic crisis. The financial consequences have hit people of color the hardest. We document this fi financial impact on households in a new poll by NPR the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Harvard Chan School. It shows just how serious the financial fallout has been for individual households and families with many experiencing drastic losses of income that make it all but impossible to pay credit card bills, the rent or the mortgage. All of this despite $2 trillion in federal aid intended to keep people afloat. Today, we're going to look at the results of that poll and take a, a broader look at how the financial side of this crisis is unfolding in cities across the country. We're also going to talk about what policymakers and leaders can do to help people get through the next six months. And we're going to ask public health leaders what they, what people should be thinking, what what our leaders should be thinking about uh, in terms of economic insecurity as they try to control the spread of COVID-19 this coming fall and winter. So I wanna start with Bob. Bob, you're the co-director of this polling project we've had now for, for many years. Tell us um, how and why we conducted this poll and some of the results. Background for my colleagues in the audience. Uh, we have done a lot of work in surveying in natural disasters. And in a natural disaster, what happens is everybody has problems. So the poll focused only on serious problems, the kinds of things that make it hard for families and households to go on. So if you notice the results, we're not asking this didn't happen. We're asking this is really serious for you and, and your family. Uh, and so uh, uh, I've been quoted in others that the results were surprising, but uh, I, I need to explain uh, why that would be uh, uh, for that. So as, as you mentioned, this poll was conducted uh, after uh, trillions of federal expenditures, hundreds of millions of dollars of state expenditures, uh, philanthropies announcing they were going to make their number one priority helping people through this period. For it. So the numbers we expected that would be serious would be smaller. What we did expect, which my colleagues will discuss, are, are serious racial and ethnic uh, disparities. But you have to realize we surveyed people and the aid programs probably are as large as after the Great Depression to do that. We could not imagine 
the number of people in serious financial problem that we found. That was a surprise. We thought billions and billions and trillions put a cushion under people's lives. And so if we just look at the first slide, please. And also you have to understand when you talk to people in a real disaster, there are a few basic things that really bother them. And I want to fo just focus on that. So we asked about uh, just the number of financial problems. And please only answer if it's really a serious issue for your household. And so the, the two things that strike you is the numbers for everybody are staggering. And then secondly, the racial and ethnic differences. But think trillions of dollars are spent and 72% of Latinos and 60% of Blacks and 55% of Native Americans are reporting serious problems that threaten their household. It's just hard to believe. Didn't any of this put a cushion uh, uh, under their own lives? Let's just briefly look at the next slide. And so uh, when you actually interview people in disasters, the problems they have are much more basic than you often discuss at universities. So uh, basically four in 10 of minority communities have all their savings gone. And so just think about this next week, I have to do something there. My children have to stay home. I have to buy something. There is no savings for 40% of people. Any discretionary problem they have for 40% is gone. And then uh, in public health, we always focus on food security. And that is a problem for these groups here. But the basics uh, that we somehow never talk about is these people do not have money to pay their rent, uh, mortgage, car payments. And uh, though, and a lot of uh, Joe's journalists are pursuing this, well, we've protected people, they can't lose their house or, or, or their apartment. It turns out story after story, they're not anywhere near as protected uh, as you would think. So you have uh, the minority population, the highest deaths, highest cases, uh, can't pay their utilities. Uh, and this has real implications. Then you say, well, these things happen. No, it's in an era where we're spending trillions uh, for this. Uh, next, and then we'll open it up to the, the group. Uh, we have an incredible problem for young minority children. We are telling parents now, in most cases, their schools will not be open. They will have to educate their children online uh, for a period of time. These are kids who really study after study show they benefit by structured education. Uh, so what we have, and you can see uh, briefly, and it affects all groups, parents are having a terrible time converting their home uh, into educational institutions. Uh, it sounds a lot better when you hear it discussed on an internet chat uh, than it appears to be in, in people's homes. But I'm only gonna make one other point uh, and if you go to the bottom, what we discovered is, and a superintendent after superintendent being interviewed by NPR, well, we're sending the iPads home. Don't worry about it. They'll be ready. Uh, turns out a very large number uh, of parents and minority parents have an internet connection that doesn't work. So what we're really talking about, kids falling behind, uh, and they're trying to take this math class online, and the internet keeps going off and off and off. And so uh, if this was a three week problem, it, it, it would be a different story. This could be a much longer problem. So the takeaway is uh, that we have staggering financial problems and the problems uh, that relate are so basic that you could be talking about people losing their households, totally unable to manage the education of their kids. Uh, o o over the next six months. That's the takeaway. But again, I want to remind people, if I listened to the national news, I thought trillions of dollars were putting a life raft under particularly minority communities with the highest number of cases. What our survey says, I don't know where that life raft is. And we'll talk about this later. Uh, uh, we had nothing to do with this the poll and discovered the Congress took whatever life raft uh, uh, away. So we'll be discussing this in the future with no life raft there at all. Joe, that's where we stood. Thank you, Bob. Yes, the, the poll results were really dramatic. I just want to uh, add a couple of details about the mechanics. We fielded the poll in July uh, when the virus was peaking in a couple of the cities where we fielded 
uh, a bigger sample. There were about 3,400 people surveyed nationwide. And we also um, uh, surveyed four, four of, of, the, of the four largest cities in the US, New York, LA, Chicago, and Houston, uh, to try to get a handle on the impact as these cities were uh, had either just come out of the first peak or um, uh, were just entering the, the next one. Um, the other thing Bob alluded to was um, a series that we, uh, of stories that we've been running on NPR all this month. And if you want to find them, you can go to npr.org and search for coronavirus and families. Just a little plug there. David, I want to turn to you next. Uh, because you study the relationships between race, economic opportunity, and community investment and health. Um, what's your reaction to these poll results? Well, I, I think it is very dramatic evidence that the pandemic is making a very bad situation worse. So where, where were my popular minority communities before the pandemic hit? Uh, what national data tells us that black households earn 59 cents for every dollar of income uh, white households earn. And that's where Native American households were as well. And Latino households earn 73 cents of income for every dollar of, of income that white households uh, earn. And as bad as those income gaps are, they dramatically understate racial differences in economic circumstances because income captures the flow of resources into the household. It doesn't tell us about what are the economic reserves. And the latest data from the Federal Reserve Board, again, before the pandemic hit, was that for every dollar of wealth white households have, black households have 10 pennies and Latino households have 12 pennies. When you have no wealth, you, you, you are one paycheck away from being homeless. You are one paycheck away from not being able to feed your children. And, and that was where uh, the, these communities were. And then, um, the pandemic is not just a health crisis, it worsens the economic crisis because we're talking about illness and death in those communities. We're talking about the loss of life to the breadwinners, people who were bringing income into the households. And the important point that, that viewers need to keep in mind, these racial ethnic differences are not acts of God. They're not random events. It didn't just happen they reflect the successful implementation of social policy. They illustrate one of the most powerful mechanisms of racism that no one sees, and that's residential segregation that determines where people live and the opportunities that they have linked to place. One study by a Harvard economist showed that if we could eliminate residential segregation in the United States, we would completely erase black-white differences in income, in education and in unemployment and black white differences in single motherhoods by two thirds. So we have created a, a mess and we now need to think of what we can do to give these communities a fighting chance. All right. Thank you very much, David. Those are some powerful thoughts to consider and we'll, we'll pick up on those uh, a little later in our uh, panel discussion. Um, Chicago is one of the four cities that I mentioned that we did um, um, uh, extra surveying in this poll. Uh, and we found that half of all households there are facing serious financial problems, uh, or they have been during the pandemic. Ngozi, tell us what you're seeing firsthand in Chicago. Yes, thank you so much. So I guess there's an irony when we talk about the different keys to ending the pandemic. We talk about having more testing. We talk about contact tracing. And it's very easy to forget or imagine how people can't afford the consequences of a test, the consequences of contact tracing. A lot of these communities have, are working in, quote, essential uh, work forces where they are making everyone's lives smoother, helping things continue, but they're also in these jobs that put them front and center in the midst of the pandemic and encountering many people every day. Uh, and yet, though they're putting their lives at risk every day, they're often low paying jobs. These are not jobs that you can dial it in from home. You can't Zoom or WebEx into these jobs. So they have these low paying, high interaction with the public. And then if they were to get sick, develop symptoms, then they have to think about what a positive test means. I don't go to work for how long? 10 days at least. 
and I don't have benefits, I don't have sick days, can I afford to even find out that I'm positive? Do I want someone to give my name up in the contact tracing, which means I'm exposed and should quarantine for 14 days? Is that even something I can do? Uh, not to mention the, the threat of eviction, all the worry and the uncertainty. If you do have to, if you've lost your job, if you've lost hours, if you've lost your wages, if you've lost the breadwinner, the, you know, we've tried to put some things in place with the eviction, eviction moratorium in Illinois uh, uh, at the state level. And then the mayor Lightfoot has added some additional protections, but we already know uh, from 2010 to 2017, there were 23 thousand evictions in the city of Chicago. And the Metropolitan Planning Council estimates that that could nearly double next year. And so pe people may have, you know, an eviction moratorium now, they know that they don't know how long it will last and it won't be indefinite. So they're also living under the threat of being homeless with just a moment's notice. And, and finally, I'd like to bring up just the, the situation with the schools, after school programs, um, Remote, remote learning could make the decision for a family that I, I can't go to work because I don't have childcare now. And so that creates the situation that's the decision is made. I can't go to work because I, I don't have anyone to watch these kids, you know, at home. Uh, not to, you mentioned that the broadband access may not be available to everyone. You know, it was given out on a, you know, maybe first come first serve, then when the supplies run out. Um, and as someone who's worked at the Cook County Juvenile Detention Center, for over 10 years, I know intimately how much these after school programs pre provide a safe haven for the most at risk kids. And so when they don't have this safe place to, to go, to play, to learn, to, you know, to be safe, the streets will literally eat them up. And so those, uh, the loss of those after school programs has created yet another difficulty in terms of what has happened to our youth in, in often high risk settings uh, when they don't have some of those safe havens that really did just that. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, some really striking um, thoughts there, uh, particularly on the issue of eviction. I wanna come back to that in a few minutes. Um, uh, Barbara Frere, you're the director of the LA County uh, Department of Public Health. And uh, as you know, our poll uh, found that in LA more than 60% of households uh, that include adults uh, who've had a job or wage, or uh, our poll has shown that 60% of the households in LA um, have seen job or wage loss during the pandemic. Uh, can you fill us in on what you're seeing in your community more? Yeah, no, thanks so much. And, and uh, good morning, everyone. I think, you know, very similar to uh, what Ngazi and what David have already spoken to is, you know, we started this journey in the pandemic uh, with unfortunately huge inequities um, in job security, in housing security, and food security. And we're also um, a county where the majority of people who live here are people of color. Um, and so it's stark uh, when you look at the impact of the pandemic across uh, our communities, um, particularly across the Latinx, Latino, Latina community, uh, which has been hardest hit. Um, and I think, again, like both David and Ngazi have pointed out, uh, the inequities we see in health outcomes from COVID-19 mirror inequities we see in educational outcomes and housing outcomes, uh, as well as in sort of economic security outcomes. You know, we in fact have, at this point in the pandemic, where we've actually been narrowing the gap, we still have uh, communities with the least number of uh, resources available to them, highest rates of poverty, four times the death rate when compared to our wealthiest communities. Uh, even though we've narrowed the gap for Latinx, Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian communities and black communities, they're two times more likely to have more cases and two times more likely to die. And if you go back to uh, what are the factors that contribute to the inequities we're seeing, you're going to have to talk about issues related to racism, and you're going to have to talk about the lack of protections for workers. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, for us here in LA County, we're clear uh, that the path forward has to pay a lot more attention to those workers who have to work uh, and go to work and are struggling around what to do with their children uh, and are struggling with not having protections in workplaces. 
And we've gone into sites where we've inspected. Uh, we've had hundreds of people that are infected at work sites. They are not following the directives in the health officer order. These are not recommendations. These are requirements and they're flagrant violations six, seven, eight months into a pandemic. Uh, businesses have to get on board. We have to understand if, if workers uh, cannot do their jobs with safety, then we close, we close down work sites and we see huge increases in rates of transmission back in the neighborhoods where people live uh, and, um, and, and in fact uh, need to interact with others, often with overcrowded housing. And as I think Ngazi rightfully pointed out, without the resources that are needed to effectively uh, isolate and quarantine. You have to have a, a safety net. You know, if you look at places that have been more successful in reducing the impact of COVID-19, which then makes it possible to have more economic security, get back to people going to work, they are places that have a huge social safety net. Uh, people do not lose their paychecks when they have to stay home because the public health department told them to isolate or quarantine. That's an untenable situation. You know, people cannot lose their housing um, because they cannot pay their rent because there's no job that they're going to. Uh, and without creating that economic security, uh, it is really gonna be hard to actually slow the spread of the virus to the point that we actually can support the recovery journey we'd all like to be on at this point uh, in, in the pandemic. You know, we're seven, eight months out uh, in really trying to slow the spread here. I think we've learned a lot, but I think it requires huge policy changes. Uh, and it's not just policy changes that go into effect when you have you know, a disaster. These have policy changes that we have to make uh, that will stay in effect uh, and will actually change the disproportionate burden in communities of color and the fact that those communities do not have the resources and opportunities needed for optimal health and well-being. Uh, thank you. I just want to uh, ask a, a follow-up question, Barbara. When you talk about um, places that have provided the support that's needed to implement the public health measures, the classic public health measures of contact tracing, testing, et cetera, and provide housing where it's, where it's needed, you're talking about other countries, right? I am talking about other countries, but I want to give a lot of credit. Here in LA County, we do offer housing. Uh, we have isolation and quarantine facilities. We do try to, you know, bridge the gap both on, you know, sort of wages and particularly around food security uh, with programs that have been stood up both by the city of LA and the county. But it's not the, it's not a woven, integrated uh, social safety net. Um, people have to apply and there are limited resources uh, for people uh, across the entire county. Because as you noted, uh, LA County started with very high rates of economic insecurity and food insecurity before the pandemic. All right, thank you. Um, Howard Coe, I wanna to turn to you next. Um, you've held a number of um, leadership positions in government, both federal and state. You were assistant secretary for, uh, at the, uh, assistant secretary for health at the Department of Health and Human Services here in Washington. And you also served as the uh, director of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. So from your point of view, what should federal and state policymakers be doing right now to support people who are experiencing such serious financial hardship during the pandemic? Well, thank you so much, Joe, for moderating this panel. And let me begin by thanking Bob Linden and his wonderful team for this really important forum with some great, great colleagues. I'm really happy to comment today as a physician and professor, as the former assistant secretary and state health commissioner for Massachusetts, and perhaps most importantly, as an Asian American and a proud son of an immigrant family. Uh, we are now in month nine of the pandemic response in this country, and we've all come to realize that this acute devastating crisis has become a chronic devastating crisis. And if we in public health ever needed a reminder that the future is understanding the broad social determinants of health, the results from Bob's survey underscore that theme. So what can we do about it? I just wanna put on the table five major actions that our society must endorse and move forward on immediately. And through the rest of this conversation beyond, we can come back to these themes. 
First, as Bob mentioned, the initial CARES Act that was passed in late March uh, amounted to about $2.2 trillion, but it's not nearly enough. Everybody realizes that. You all probably know that in May, I believe, the House passed a so-called HEROES Act that would serve as a follow-up for a st federal stimulus package, but that's still being debated in the Senate. Uh, I understand that that act was just updated in the last several days. So we need more federal stimulus dollars because if we don't, this devastation across the country and particularly minority communities will only uh, get worse. Uh, there are so many ways that funding could be used, but uh, one major theme is to support small businesses, perhaps in minority communities that attend to issues like food banks and supporting food retailers. I have some personal knowledge of this. Uh, one of my late beloved uncles, a proud Korean American immigrant, uh, works seven days a week running a small convenience store and food market. So I know that in his role back then, you know, he provided for his family, he provided for his community in a time of need. And this all relates to the essential worker themes that Ngozi and Barbara have already mentioned. Uh, the second priority is we all have to understand that every state is facing major budget shortfalls right now. And we have to watch carefully about how those shortfalls are going to be addressed. So here in Massachusetts, for example, I've been told that the budget shortfall may be as large as five to six billion. So how will governors and state leaders everywhere begin to address this without making the suffering documented in Bob's poll even worse? There are debates and discussions about raising revenues using a so-called progressive revenue model. And that's asking the thriving sectors of our economy right now to, to pay more, pay their fair share, many would say. But while that debate continues, there's gotta be universal consensus that we can't further burden uh, low and middle income households and small businesses. Third priority has been already alluded to by Ngozi and Barbara uh, and David, and that is uh, we are facing a looming homelessness crisis in the midst of COVID. Uh, we already have over half a million people who are homeless in this country, but Bob's poll suggests that that number may grow dramatically by orders of magnitude. We may have a tsunami of homelessness going forward if we don't address the challenges that Bob has presented in his polling results. Uh, so many uh, are aware, as Ngozi mentioned, that there are policies for eviction moratorium at the state and federal level. I have to stress these are temporary fixes. They're not permanent solutions. And uh, there's some challenges with these. So for example, the federal one, which was announced by CDC ends on December 31st. So what happens after that for vulnerable households? Uh, meanwhile, here in Massachusetts, for example, the moratorium is ending October 17th. Uh, in New York, Governor Cuomo just announced extending the moratorium there to the end of the year as well. Uh, there are inconsistencies about aligning these state and federal policies and Advocacy groups like the Massachusetts Public Health Association here in our state, led by my wonderful colleague, Carlene Pavlos, uh, has made this a high priority issue with respect to addressing health equity. Uh, these issues are important to us at our school because we have a new initiative on health and homelessness that began a year ago, trying to build an academic community to pay attention to these themes. And I have the honor of chairing that and working very closely with Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, a national leading program led by our dear friend, Dr. Jim O'Connell. And by the way, many of you may or may not know that there are some 300 dedicated healthcare for the homeless programs across the country funded by HHS. Uh, the National Council on Healthcare for the Homeless has been promoting this work for quite a while. So we need to pay attention to funding for those heroic providers in this time of need. Uh, the fourth priority in my view is we gotta start rebuilding public health right now, not waiting for later. Uh, we have to start increasing the personnel support and the infrastructure. Let me, let me tell you a couple examples of how this could work. We have a flu vaccination campaign going on right now, and we have to make this successful if we're ever going to have an on-ramp for a successful COVID vaccination campaign in the future. So how can we make that happen? We could talk about the importance of prevention to our families and to our communities, 
Uh, Ngozi mentioned contact tracers. In my view, those need to be not just temporary workers for local health departments, but be hired permanently as community health workers. Uh, and then another way to strengthen public health in this great time of need is to make our public health surveillance data as strong as possible. It's been very difficult to see how weak our surveillance data has been, particularly by occupation and industry and race and ethnicity. And with respect to data on minorities, let me say as an Asian American, uh, we need much more attention to disaggregation of the Asian category, which represents some 50 ethnicities and 100 languages. So Bob's poll is actually one of the few ones that has an Asian category, but we need much more uh, attention to, the, to data disaggregation going forward. And then my last comment before I turn it back to you, Joe, is we are in a time where the Affordable Care Act is at risk. It's very disturbing. It's almost unfathomable that our country would even consider of repealing this act in a time of a pandemic. We know so many people have lost jobs and they're losing job-related health insurance as well. Uh, COVID uh, is on its way to becoming another pre-existing condition. So we have to pay attention to that major theme going forward as well. So let me stop right there and turn it back to you, Joe. All right, thank you very much, Howard. I am, um, we have covered a lot of issues here uh, so far today and um, I want to try to, to uh, sort through them uh, now and uh, as we turn to the discussion portion of our panel. Um, before we do, let's remind our audience that this is the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, presented jointly by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and NPR. Uh, viewers, if you have questions, you can post them here in Zoom, or you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu and we'll try to get to those a little bit later in our discussion. Uh, but right now I want to uh, pick up on a theme that um, uh, Howard was just talking about, um, which is the CARES Act. Um, it was signed in March, uh, $2 trillion, as Bob has mentioned. Uh, that amounts to about $6,000 per taxpayer, just an astonishing amount uh, that included 500 billion for distressed businesses, 300 billion, uh, in actual checks to individuals and uh, the 250 billion to support uh, extra unemployment payments that of course ran out at the end of July. Um, we're hearing today that the uh, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi and Treasury Secretary Mnuchin are continuing negotiations on a trillion dollar package, uh, but there has been no new package since July and uh, as we've heard here, uh, deadlines are approaching for evictions and people are simply out of money. So Bob, let me turn to you first and talk more about this need for uh, an emergency stimulus to, to stabilize the households that we found that were in such distress. Uh, so uh, just uh, briefly, uh, it, because my background is in national emergencies, if we were talking about the Gulf, uh, what you would discover is that after a massive hurricane, they prioritize aid to the communities that were most hit by the storm. I know that sounds surprising to people uh, uh, for that. So if, if my neighborhood wasn't wiped out by the storm, they don't send me a $6,000 check. Uh, they really focus. So here we have communities that are being hit by high rates of the disease and deaths. So the first thing you would do and without getting details is have a financial package which gets disproportionate if you're in a community that has high death rates. Let's stop a, a lot of the, uh, that. And secondly, um, it, it's hard, and because I'm not an expert in these areas, when people tell me they can't pay bills over and over, they're going to lose their houses and everything else, without any training, it says to me, I bet you we could send them a check and help them through this. Uh, the emergency aid could be done by checks in high uh, dose areas uh, for that. But the second thing I want to ask is, uh, and it's equivalent of surveying after a big hurricane, somebody has to interview people why the Congress thought they got you out of this problem and you can't pay your rent. You think you're homeless. You can't cover your kids. Something went wrong with the way that money went out, because not that the racial differences that David hit are not gonna be there, those numbers should never have been that large. This is huge money. There's something wrong. 
I don't understand it. I don't know how to use it. I can't get it. Uh, my spouse can't get it. And there's something going on with this aid program that people who are in desperate shape can get it. So one is just prioritize aid for the incident of the cases in the communities. And two, find out how you make it user friendly. There's something going on here that people who are going to fall apart cannot easily access this. That happens when you're a pollster and you're not on the ground. Hmm. Barbara, so how effective has the program in LA been that you talked about earlier? I mean, do we, have, do we have data? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think we, we've had our challenges like everywhere else. I, I think one of the challenges is it's, it's relatively piecemeal. And there are different application processes depending on which program you're needing to use. It's not like a universal program that if you're in a high need community, it's just there for you. Uh, we've done a better job, I think, with the quarantine and isolation facilities. Uh, but even there, again, uh, you need to be in contact with a community-based organization uh, to get a referral into that system. Right? That could be a healthcare provider. Uh, that could be, uh, you know, it's, it's a range of social service agencies. But I, I think I want to point out that as, as good as I think we're doing and as helpful as I think it has been, there have been thousands of people, for example, who have not been able to uh, successfully isolate and quarantine at their homes that have been able to use the quarantine and isolation facilities. Um, it hasn't met everyone's needs. Um, and in particular, it hasn't done uh, what I think, um, you know, Bob was just calling for, which is really acknowledge we've had some communities that have been devastated in multiple ways, both in terms of illness and death, but also in terms of the economic uh, hardships. Um, and it's those communities that really need uh, a, a, an integrated approach uh, that makes it easy for people to get the support that they're going to need. If you have to, you know, separately apply for and figure out where do I go for uh, dealing with the fact that I don't have enough food. Now, where do I go? Because I might need to isolate. And now where do I go? Because I haven't had a paycheck for two weeks. And oh, by the way, because I was infected, everybody else in my household also couldn't go to work because they were asked to quarantine. So now you have an entire household with no income that goes on for weeks. Um, so I think the system does have to be more uh, money directly into the pockets of uh, the people who are hardest hit and supporting the organizations that are already in the community that have close ties um, to the people who are hardest hit. You know, our smallest community-based organizations have been heroes, uh, you know, quiet heroes not recognized on the front lines of helping families uh, with all of the challenges uh, that they have trying to uh, cope with this devastating pandemic. Uh, and they too, are getting wiped out without adequate resources. I think there was a poll that showed that the distribution to businesses uh, really left out most of the minority-owned businesses. Um, and and again, you know, we ha we have to look at what happens that we create hurdles and barriers on the application process that leave out the very organizations that I think have proven themselves over and over and over again as providing lifeline services in communities that, in this case, are hardest hit by the pandemic, but I would say in communities that have disproportionately been affected by disinvestment uh, and systemic racism that has not allowed us uh, to really build up the resources uh, that are needed to protect people. All right, uh, Ngozi, um, you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, the community-based organizations uh, and how they're uh, how they are, or how they're not helping uh, in Illinois and in Chicago there. And um, yeah. So, you know, obviously some have been grounded by the pandemic where they themselves have experienced uh, closure. You know, donations have stopped flowing in. Uh, but of course, they're, they are trying to contribute to the work that, you know, the state agencies, particularly the Health and Human Services portfolio is working. So they are aggressively supplementing that work. We have faith-based organizations, the community-based organizations, businesses. There's examples of, uh, you know, Catholic Charities, for example, provides meals uh, to, to homeless people, to seniors, uh, to disabled uh, individuals. Uh, they provide housing and shelter. Uh, there's a 
the Access Living. This is a specific organization targeted towards helping uh, differently abled communities. So they're helping those people who may be hearing impaired to work uh, in this new remote environment, uh, provide homework hotlines. Uh, businesses like uh, Comcast are trying to increase the internet speed in these uh, low income uh, areas and, and population. So we have seen, you know, diverse efforts by all segments of the of the community because this has to be an all in approach. It's not just what the state government or the local government. We need help from from all stakeholders, and that includes everyone. Great, thank you, uh, David. Um, I want to turn uh, next to if you have more thoughts on this, please add them. But I I want to turn the corner a little bit and talk about the health impact of this financial instability uh, during a pandemic. Um, talk to us more about uh, the interaction between um, this, the extreme stress that some people are experiencing here. There's a large body of research on, on the negative effects of stress on health. Uh, the extent to which persons dealing with cumulative high levels of, of toxic stress and, and financial stress is, is one of those, but the loss of loved ones uh, is one of those. And remember, minority communities already, uh, because of higher death rates, already have higher losses of loved ones. And so this is, this is additional bereavement that they're dealing with. And what the research shows is that high levels of stress um, has negative effects effects on both physical and mental health. And, and, and it leads to many of the chronic diseases that we see uh, are the risk factors for not doing well uh, with COVID-19. And, and so what we have is the worsening uh, uh, of a situation in terms of uh, the, this financial stress that, that is, is so difficult uh, for communities and for poor households to deal with. And so I, I just wanna emphasize a point that so many of the speakers have already made, that, that we need a, a, a coordinated and integrated plan uh, to, to help uh, these disadvantaged communities. They are in fact our essential workers. They are part of the engine of our, our economy. And, and as we look at those vulnerable populations, we cannot forget the undocumented immigrants who, who have faced additional barriers in terms of accessing resources. And again, they are part of what keeps our economy going. So it's in our long-term best interest to make that investment. Sometimes I talk about the need for a Marshall Plan uh, for disadvantaged communities, the way the world came together and we came together to help rebuild um, uh, Western Europe after World War II. We need to think of what do we do for our disadvantaged communities, whether they are in uh, poor white communities in Appalachia or communities of color in, in our large cities. We need to make those investments and they are in our long-term economic interests as a nation. Um, thank you. Um, I, I said a few minutes ago that I wanted to come back to the issue of evictions. Uh, Howard talked a lot about it, uh, and Ghazi also mentioned it. Uh, I've just been struck in our discussions both here today and when we were talking the other day about these deadlines that are coming up. And we've interviewed a number of people for our stories on NPR. Uh, people are just looking at they have no alternative to, but to now live on the street. Um, how how bad could it be, um, say, December 31st, when uh, one of the deadlines uh, ends, or in various states? I mean, is anyone really making preparations for how to deal with thousands and thousands of these homeless people? So is that for me, Joe, or? Anyone. <laughs> Howard. Howard, go ahead. If I can chime in on this, because this is really front and center for the public health community right now. And you know, we should start by saying that through these national conversations about health disparities and health equity, it's people who are homeless who suffer the most, the highest burden of disparities of any population in our society. And they're overlooked all the time. Um, and we don't pay enough attention to this issue. Uh, one reason why we started an initiative at our school a year ago is there's been almost no attention from academic schools and universities to try to address this major health equity issue. So with respect to eviction moratorium challenges, um, 
people may not realize, and I only recently learned, that a moratorium on eviction is not equivalent to rent relief. It just means that for that period, you're, you can't be kicked out on the street. But when the moratorium expires, the issue comes up of who pays for the back rent. And so that's a major challenge now facing the country in every state. It is a major concern for tenants and landlords alike. The HEROES Act that we've mentioned uh, apparently includes some $100 billion for rental assistance. And so that would be a step forward. But of course, that act hasn't passed yet. Uh, hopefully, it will soon. Uh, and then in the meantime, we're trying to coordinate these deadlines that are different at the federal and state level uh, on, in, in, across the country. Um, there have been efforts by some states, uh, Barbara may want to comment more, in California, where the homelessness issue has gotten so much attention up through and including the governor. You know, some of the CARES Act money was dedicated to acquiring uh, hotel space and motel space and residential care facilities to, to house people. That's very important. What we've come to learn through our work on healthcare for the homeless is that you also need to couple that with really dedicated support services because people have uh, substance use issues. They may suffer from mental health challenges. Uh, and so it's not just the housing, but it's also the services and support that are really important. So I'm hoping that with more attention to issues like rent relief um, and turning from a temporary fix to a more permanent solution, uh, we can try to prevent this looming threat of homelessness that is on the horizon. Joe, can I add just one sure. point? Um, one of the things that we were not aware of, uh, many of the rent protection things do not include your utilities. And so uh, it's pretty hard to live if they turn off your electricity and, and your fuel. You can't be here. Cool. And so half the states have no utility protection, essentially. Utilities can make a choice. They're not going to continue. So you technically could be able to live in a place long as there's no air, air circulation or anything. So this can happen very quickly because we found so many people who cannot pay their utilities. They're just struggling right now. So it's a twofold. It's not I just get evicted, evicted. But first is unless there's protection, I may not be able to hold on to the utilities that, that make it possible for my family to live. Very good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Um, so just you know, I mean, the situation is dire. We started uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. We had 66,000 people who are experiencing homelessness here in LA County. That's an alarming number, uh, and and it's. Um, it really represents, again, uh, the disastrous applications of failed social policies um, that have allowed us to tolerate uh, the numbers of people uh, that experience in homelessness and you know, are living either, as you know, in LA County in our encampments, uh, which are uh, both uh, risky places uh, emotionally, uh, but also uh, during a pandemic particularly um, can can create a particular set of additional hardships on uh, people who are trying to just survive, uh, and we have, as as uh, as Howard noted, uh, with support from the governor and the county, aggressive programs uh, using, as a matter of fact, the pandemic as an opportunity to really shine a light on the need for us to understand the vulnerability of people experiencing homelessness, many of which are at highest risk for serious illness and even death should they become infected with COVID-19 to try to, in fact, offer alternative housing arrangements. We have what was Project Room Key and now is Project Home Key. Uh, there's all a uh, built-in set of incentives uh, for both landlords um, and individual households uh, who may have extra space to be able to offer uh, housing. I think you were right uh, to note that uh, people do need a, a set of support services. We all really need a set of support services. Uh, but once you've been living on the street for a while, uh, you're going to need help uh, for sure uh, as you transition into more stable housing. Um, and so that has to be part of all of the efforts. But I think the biggest thing is if you have 66,000 people already experiencing homelessness in LA County, we're huge. We're over 10 million people. You cannot afford a single more, a single additional person. Right. Uh, 
to come into homelessness. I mean, some of our biggest efforts right now have to be not only making sure that people who are experiencing homelessness have safer places uh, where they can go and live, but also making sure we're not creating with the pandemic a whole new pipeline. And I think you're right. It is about rent relief. Uh, the eviction moratoriums are important, but if people have to pay six, seven months of back rent and they haven't had a job, uh, that's going to be impossible. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and I do agree also that that has to come along with the need for utilities. You know, it's heartbreaking uh, to think that we're already people may are, are in their houses and their utilities have been turned off and talk about distance learning challenges. Uh, talk about, you know, we're in the midst of another heat wave, uh, trying to make sure people can stay safe uh, when we don't really want people congregating uh, in common spaces. So, you know, being able to be safe in your home uh, is really paramount. You know, I think the irony for all of us is when we started the pandemic, uh, our first initiative was safer at home. Uh, and that really meant everyone needed to stay uh, in they their needed, house. They That's needed a home. home. But yes. you need a home to be safer at home. We have been getting a number of questions online. Um, I want to pick up uh, on one of them, which uh, sort of um, what Barbara was talking about a minute ago. Um, with a COVID-19 vaccine expected in the next few months, and given all the vulnerabilities exposed in this poll uh, and all the people living on the street as public health uh, leaders, um, there's a lot of discussion about who should be getting the vaccine first. And I think there's little debate that healthcare workers and frontline workers should get it. But uh, do we need to be prioritizing the people who we are talking about having such a serious impact in this poll? I throw that open to anyone. I can start. Uh, there, that's been a critically important question that's been posed to national experts. And the National Academy of Medicine put out some draft priority lists that included the groups that you mentioned, Joe. I think this Friday, there's going to be yet another national webinar to update conversation on that. So with that, any new vaccine that comes available, it's, there's always challenges at the, at the beginning about having enough for everybody. And so priority groups need to be identified and supported. So I'm glad the National Academy of Medicine and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices for the CDC and other groups are tackling this because we need consensus on those categories as we enter that process. Otherwise, it's gonna make all this even more difficult. So stay tuned to those discussions going forward. Um, I have a question, another question for Dr. Williams. Uh, you spoke about the stress on children and families uh, going through extreme hardships. Um, during normal times, schools, of course, are part of the social support system. Um, they provide food to a huge number of, of people, of, of children. Uh, but of course, school has now been disrupted for most children this year. Uh, what could schools do now, even through these disruptions, to handle, uh, to help students with this kind of stress? Uh, there's variation across communities in the United States. There are some communities where the schools, even though they are closed, are still providing um, uh, free lunches uh, to students who previously benefited from them. And I think that kind of creativity and innovation has to be put in place. The fact that schools are closed, the needs that exist for these uh, children are still there. And, and taking care of these children and taking care of their health not only facilitates their learning, but it also, research shows, facilitates their health as an adult. So it's, it's an investment that we are making that will pay off uh, for society and for our communities long term. And um, on a, another subject, I would be remiss if we left this discussion uh, by just concentrating on, on big cities. Uh, the pandemic has moved into smaller communities and into rural areas. And we will be highlighting some of the results from this poll uh, next week uh, on uh, the impact on rural America. And I just wonder, how does a lot of this translate? Are we going to see more homelessness in rural America? Um, are, are they all the same issues or are there special uh, issues for rural America that people should be thinking about? Many, many of the problems are, are similar and are impacting our rural communities as well. Uh, in our state, which most of the counties are in fact classified as rural, uh, we see that the, the lack of broadband access was a major issue in rural communities. They wanted to start school. Uh, and then when they couldn't start school, they realized uh, we don't have access. We don't have any access in this area. So that is major. 
just the access to even healthcare over since uh, in the last 10 years, more than 121 rural hospitals have shut their doors. And so that means that 57 million Americans that depended on rural hospitals had that interrupted. So uh, with fewer options for healthcare, uh, greater time to get uh, to a new uh, hospital, uh, with combining that with loss of income and financial instability, we see that, yes, our, our rural communities are in fact in, affected in, in much of the same ways and even additional ways. And, and I'd also, I'd want to add to that, you know, making sure that we're well aware in some of our rural communities, um, there are lots, thousands and thousands of farm workers um, who, again, you know, lack basic protections, basic protections at their work sites, basic protections about where they're staying, uh, and basic protections in terms of any kind of economic security should they become sick. And that I think has compounded the issue, certainly in some of the rural counties here in, in uh, California, um, where you've seen huge, huge increases uh, in cases, really fueled by the unfairness of uh, the systems that are there, again, to protect essential workers because uh, we all need the food uh, that uh, people are in the field, you know, really supporting the rest of us with very, very little attention being paid to them, very little, I think, as Ngazi rightfully pointed out, access to basic health services, but even other services uh, that really fuel spread of uh, COVID-19, such as overcrowded housing. Um, you know, it, it, it really is sort of magnified in some of our rural communities, uh, and funny. we're not paying a lot of attention to that issue. Very, very good points. Um, we only have a few minutes left. I want to get uh, one takeaway from each of you um, before we go. And uh, Ngozi, I will let you go first because I know you have a press conference to go to. <laughs> thank you. So again, um, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this panel. Uh, there's, you know, this new coronavirus, we called it the novel coronavirus because it was new and unknown. But of course, this new virus is doing something very common in terms of creating uh, not new problems, but magnifying and highlighting those. And so as just like we talked about Hurricane Katrina did similar things, Hurricane Maria, now we've had Hurricane COVID, if you will, that's sweeping through. And so the question now is, are we going to act in a real new way to create the safeguards and guardrails to prevent these same people, these same communities who keep bearing the brunt when the next disaster hurricane hits. We've talked about short-term solutions that need to be dealt with for the here and now so people can get to tomorrow. But I also very much look forward to the additional discourse for the tomorrow to address the foundations and the fundamentals that created this overly susceptible, highly vulnerable population that's disproportionately impacted whenever something comes through. I look forward to the ongoing challenging work that lies ahead. David, I will come to you next. So I, I think we, we need to take urgent action now for the crises we face, but we have to do more. Um, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic is not the last one we will face. And we need to think of what we can do now by, by creating healthy homes and healthy communities and providing opportunities in education and employment so that we can develop herd immunity of a, of a different kind uh, to these social determinants of health so that when the next pandemic hits, we are in a much stronger place. Very good. Um, Barbara, I'll come to you next. And I, I, really, I really have appreciated everybody's uh, comments, your wise counsel. I, I think everyone has all, all of the listeners as well. Um, I do want to note that, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's very important to recognize that uh, there are lessons we have learned uh, just uh, over the last few months. And it's really absurd to think uh, we're not using the information we've already gleaned um, to actually make some fundamental changes. Um, and I want to really highlight, you know, the pandemic has really been on the backs of people of color, as have so many other injustices. Um, and it's really time to uh, not just uh, acknowledge that uh, and produce uh, reports that actually verify uh, information that I think people living in our communities already know. They know their hardest hit and they know that the conditions are unfair and they know that it has nothing to really do with their individual behavior. Um, so, you know, again, we see a lot of sort of let's blame the people who are doing the worst. 
uh, and we should have learned by now, but certainly uh, from uh, you know February uh, through what we've seen, that without some systemic changes uh, that really uh, get, again, I think what Ngozi said to the root causes uh, around addressing issues related to racism and disproportionality and understanding the unfairness of systems that penalize uh, those among us who have the least resources. The least resources uh, to address a pandemic, the least resources to address uh, financial instability, the least resources to address issues uh, related to uh, really promoting health and well-being for themselves, their families, and their communities. Thank you for that. Uh, Bob, I'm going to you next. Uh, so I I'm very <coughs> hurricane natural disaster oriented. If we uh, describe this for the next six months as a major storm in the Gulf, uh, we would end the partisanship. Uh, 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 Asian fishermen losing everything in a hurricane. Republicans and Democrats get together. We have to help these people through this. We have to realize that certain communities are overwhelmed in the next natural disaster. We have to get them through the six months. But adding homelessness, having people whose kids are scarred for years because they just can't get an educational experience. But we have to stop this discussion about, well, we're doing this, dependent that, to this is a natural disaster. You've done this in other states and areas. Apply it so it's easy for people who are most affected. But at the moment, if you listen to the discussion in Congress, it's too politically polarized. It's not around the Gulf or the wildfires. How do we just make sure people who could die or lose everything are helped? And that, I think, has to change. And it has to change pretty quickly because we're going to have some very serious effects in the next few months if nothing happens. Thank you, Bob. Howard, you get the last word. So, Joe, thank you for moderating an excellent panel. And, Bob, thank you and your team once again. This has been tremendous. <laughs> if you take a step back and ask yourself, how in the world did we get into all this? Uh, the simple answer is that for far too long, our society has undervalued and underfunded and overlooked prevention and public health. All the devastation we're talking about is completely preventable, but it's not gotten the attention and the resources it deserves. So going forward, I would encourage all of our listeners and colleagues who are committed to public health to tackle this aggressively, looking through the lens of the social determinants of health. And that means reaching out beyond the health silo to as many other leaders and colleagues throughout society as possible. The more we can build non-traditional partnerships with housing and education and business and faith-based organizations, I think we can expand what public health is and make prevention stronger in the future and hopefully never get to see the devastation that we're witnessing now. Thank Certainly. You. Certainly not. Thank you for that. I hope we never see this again. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists today. Uh, I want to also uh, thank NPR, uh, the Harvard Chan School, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for their support of this project and this webcast. Um, the event is ending now, but you can, can, you can watch it again on the forum website. Uh, um, thank you very much, and good day. <laughs>